So on the pew right here, uh, we have the Graceway Flyers. It talks about our distinct areas, discipleship, coffee shop, and the youth garage. So take, don't take a lot, just take one or two each week and selectively, purposefully hand them out to somebody and ask them if they'd look through it if you're wanting to invite them to church and tell them about what's in it and uh, tell them there's a website on there and they can go to the website and check out everything um, that's, that's on there. So that is available for you um, over there before you leave. So we stopped. We're, what we're talking about, remember, is trying the spirits to see if they be of God. There's so much here. I mean, we could preach a sermon with five points and a poem and go home, and what did you really learn? Um, you, you didn't learn a whole lot that you could lose. You could use. You got a lot of information. But I, I, want, I want you to walk through, and I want to make something clear, too. We're looking at kind of ooh, ah, demon stuff. It's real. It was in the Old Testament. It's going to happen again as we approach the rapture. I think it's happening around us right now, but especially after the rapture, when the Holy Spirit's gone, boom, you're going to see a demonism forefront and center, and I believe what we're seeing in books now, movies, um, and TV shows, all that's doing is setting the groundwork and getting people's minds ready for what's going to happen at the midpoint of the tribulation when there's a war in heaven, and Satan and his fallen angels and demons are cast to this earth and confined until the end of the tribulation, where at that point in Revelation 19 and Joel chapter 2, Jesus comes with the saints to stamp out the Antichrist and all of the nations that sided with him. Okay? Then he's going to be cast into the lake of fire, uh, the hell, sorry, the bottomless pit for a thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, those in the hell or bottomless pit will be brought back up to the great white throne judgment, pronounced guilty. They're not going to get another chance. It's not like this TV show that's on called Lucifer, where they're painting a picture that, you know, Satan is kind of turning into a good guy, and he's kind of sorry about some of the things he did, and he's going to get another chance to repent and get things right. Because that's what Eastern religions teach. See, we Eastern religions are teaching their philosophy in these TV shows, and Lucifer's one of them. The magicians are another one. I could go on and on and on. That are hit TV shows with people between the ages of 13 and 35 and 40. They are just kind of enamored with the supernatural realm. And if you don't have a solid foundation in the Word of God through discipleship, you don't know how to deal with that. Because how, do, how, are you, how are you to be in the world but not of the world if you don't have the spiritual weapons to combat the world's philosophy when you're in the world? We are to be in the world and not of the world. We are to know how to make a difference in people's lives. And we need to know where their minds are so we can know where they need to be. And, and we need to understand Satan knowingly is working through individuals who are creating these movies to get his philosophy in their minds. Oh, Lucifer, I guess he, hey, he could really be a good guy, couldn't he? Oh, you get people thinking that way? The, 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 the being in this universe that hates mankind and wants them to be separated from God for eternity? And you get people thinking, maybe he is an okay guy. Maybe everything he does is not all bad. Maybe some of the things he does is for our benefit. Oh my goodness. He's full of wickedness. And yes, yes, Satan will do good things to get you to look at that instead of the Word of God to take you off track. But he's not going to do good things to make you a good person. Okay? So never buy into that lie. So we looked at this last week, the Ob. That's a soothsaying demon in Job 32. Um, this is probably why Elihu's consultation was an error because a person was being controlled by an unclean spirit. Um, if you want to go back and look at it, it's Job 32, 1 uh, through 32. The key, pat, the key verses are verses 18 and 19. And then Ob is an unclean spirit that enters an individual. And uh, you've got to open yourself up to this too. You'll, you'll see over and over and over again, if you look and see how people do this, They've got to be willing. They've got to want it. They've got to be dedicated to the craft. 
It's like I told you last week in the show, The Magicians. I mean, everything they do has like a precise way to do it. You've got to stand a precise way. You've got to do your hands a precise way. You've got to say the words like in, in Harry Potter. Uh, I don't even know if I can say why. When they're getting the leaf, the, the feather to float, the guardian leviosa. And they've got to say it just right, and they've got to flick just right. Thus, that's purposeful in demonism because they want you to buy into it. They want you to be all in. And when you're all in, then that unclean spirit has an opportunity to use you as a vessel to get their message out. Okay, Because you're tapping into the demonic world at that point. And the word spirit in that passage is ruach. And that is a wind by resemblance, a breath, very similar to the spirit capital S where God breathes. Because it's supernatural realm. So when, when, when God wrote the Word of God, the word inspiration is God breathed the Spirit. God breathed it. It was a supernatural wind as the Bible describes it. But it was the supernatural God doing that. But the supernatural evil works in some of the same ways. You don't see it. But it's a, it's a resemblance of breath that is uh, sensible. It can be an exaltation figuratively life, anger, substantiality by resemblance of spirit. And that's the, that's the, the Hebrew word there for spirit. And I know you've seen shows where the spirit comes in and they, they exhale that spirit out. And that's where they're getting how it works. It's a biblical principle. It's in the Bible. Of course, movies try to uh, make it, you know, ooh, cool, you know, don't want to do that. But it's based on real principles. Now, there is a difference in de demoniac possession and when there is an agreement. Uh, developing supernatural powers, concentration, meditation, absorption, self-control, you're focus focusing your power on what you desire to express, and then you become the power you desire to express. And that's kind of the print, that's what they're doing in the demonic realm. They want you to focus on it. They want you to be all in. They want not the Word of God, but that token, or that amulet, or that Ouija board, or, or that motion of the hands, or how you say it, or the wand. They want you to focus on that as being the source of power. But remember, that amulet, the Ouija board, the wand, none of that is the real source of power. There's nothing supernatural in those things. The real purpose of evil supernatural powers is to get you to be all in on their side. Because the same is true on the other side. God wants you to be all in with Him. For you to understand what it means to be right with God and to have that word of knowledge like we talked about with Brenda last week where you, you don't hear an audible voice but you're right with God, you're reading His Word, you're keeping close accounts with God, you're studying the Bible, you want to be used of Him. You, you, when you sin, you ask God to forgive you with a desire not to do it again. You're all in with spirit, spiritually on the positive side and that word of knowledge is not a, a verbal voice. God doesn't come to you in the Holy Spirit and say, Brenda, you see that lady right there? Verbally, and everybody, I want you to buy her a parish. No, that's not how it works. His Spirit bears spirit, uh, witness with your spirit that you're His. Most Christians don't even understand that because they're not all in. They've never had the assurance that they're even a Christian because they've never understood that presence of God, that peace and that love and that joy that comes with knowing that you're a child of God. They've just been in a church where it says if you read your Bible every day and you say a prayer and you go to church and you teach Sunday school class and you sing a choir and you look like a duck and you quack like a duck, you're a Christian. And that's all they know. They've got their little checklist of legalism that made them a Christian. They've said their Harry Potter magical formula prayer. They've been dipped into mystical water. I'm kind of making fun of it because we, that's kind of what it is if we're not careful. If we're not careful, there's nothing in the water. A prayer doesn't save you. It's your, it's your circumcision of the heart. 
You believe you're a sinner. You know that if you die, you're going to go to hell because of your sin. Because that's what the Bible says. And that Jesus came as a sinless person and paid my price and shed the, His blood on the cross and died and rose from the dead so that I could have access to the Father through what Jesus did. And I believe that in my heart of hearts. And I have a circumcision of the heart. And I don't have to pray to be saved. So when I lead someone to Christ... I don't say, let's say the sinner's prayer. I used to, because that's what I was taught to do. But that's very confusing to a lot of prayer people. Oh, I said the sinner's prayer, and I got dunked in water. And if we're not careful, we kind of buy into the supernatural battle that's going on out there. That, that prayer is something supernatural. And that, that dipping in water is something supernatural. And it's not. The water is water. It's just symbolic. So when I ask someone if they want to, I said, do you want to ask Jesus into your heart? Yeah, I do. I said, I want you to pray right now and just share with your heart and thank God for what He did right now. What you did to become a believer. Share, pray. If they're not willing to pray, they didn't get it. In my mind, they didn't get it. Now, no one's around just me and that person. So, if, see, if they truly got saved, a supernatural thing took place in their heart. The Holy Spirit just took residence in their heart. And they're a new creature that has never existed before. They're a new creation. The Holy Spirit now lives in them. And if they're not willing to pray and thank God for what they just did, whoa, they didn't get something. Because when you truly, in your heart, believe that Jesus is God and He died for you, something supernatural just took place in a positive way. You supernaturally had a, had a, have a relationship with the God of the universe because of belief. Belief. People who don't believe in God will say, I don't believe. And that's exactly true. It, it is belief. It is belief. You believe it's true or you don't believe it's true regardless of what you believe. It doesn't matter what religion is. Belief is what makes that thing real. Okay? So, uh, Yadani, a knowing one, because of giving oneself to satanic influence, that's, that's what Yadani is, it's in the Old Testament, uh, it's even alive today, this person is known as, they give themselves, they're willingly, I want this. And that's out there like crazy today. Then you have the Doresh El Hamathan. A seeker unto the dead. Another word that we might know is necromancer. That is a... I'm going to show you something here that might blow your mind. That's a necromancer. Someone who seeks the dead for advice. We have a main religion on this earth today. Not paganism per se, although it is based in paganism, when you really look at it. It's considered Christian. And they, they, they are involved in necromancy. It's the, it's the world's largest Christian religion. And they involve themselves in necromancy regularly, if not daily, if not multiple times every day, the believers are encouraged to do this. One who consults the dead for advice or information. It is not the dead person, but an ob that is in contact with the seeker. So this is two realms. You've got the satanic realm that this person is a medium and they seek the advice of the dead, but they get in contact with the demon. They don't get the dead person. They get the demon who knows everything about the dead person. That's a medium. Then you've got in the Christian realm, where paganism is slipping in, instead of seeking God for advice, people by the millions, possibly billions, are encouraged to seek dead for advice. Uh, have you heard of what a patron saint is? In the Catholic Church, you have patron saints. And they have a patron saint, and I've just, just a couple. Pages upon pages upon pages. There are thousands of patron saints in the Catholic Church. Yes? You can't read the dark colors. I, I know. I, I tried to change and I couldn't change it, so I'll read it to you. But, but, and I'll put this on the website so you can have it. But, and you can Google patron saints. And go to the Catholic catalog, thousands. And they have a patron saint for hemorrhoids. They have a patron saint. If you take this patron saint, 
And these were actual people who were in the Catholic Church who had died and they were bestowed sainthood. And you as an individual in their church are encouraged to pray to them. Dead saints. That's necromancy, folks. I don't care what you garb it in. That's necromancy. And they got it from paganism when they kind of combined with paganism the wafers, the sun god Ra, and so much in the cat when they come down with their with their incense and their smoke, it's paganism. Saints paganism, the Vestal Virgins paganism, the Pontiff Maximus paganism, every bit of it's paganism. So they've kind of taken parts of Christianity and parts of paganism and mixed it together and they came up with Catholicism. So if you, in Harry Potter, you have, uh, you, they, they can make a Patronus. It gets that word, uh, the, 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 the root word for that comes from patron. And it comes from what the patron and patron say, and the Patronus are the same. So they, they, they bring up their Patronus that protects them during their, the Harry Potter shows. That's exactly the concept of the patron saint in the Catholic Church. So the, the first one was the Cajetan. And if you are unemployed or you're a gambler or you're seeking a job, you're to pray um, to that patron saint. Camillus of Lelis, that's another patron saint. This is the patron saint, um, Courtney, for nurses or hospital workers. So if you're at the hospital and you want to pray for someone, you're involved in the Catholic Church and you want to pray to a patron saint that will help you specifically as your hospital worker, that's the saint you would pray to if you're a Catholic. So you would pray to that saint. That dead saint that supposedly, according to the Catholic Church, has the power to help you in your duties as a hospital worker, and that's nothing more than necromancy. It is demonism slipping into pseudo-Christianity. It's around us at all times. And then it keeps going on. You've got a patron saint for writers, school teachers. Karen, if you want that, that's the Cassian of Amola. That's the one you pray to. Okay. If you write shorthand, that's the one you pray to. If you're a librarian, or you are, you are a tanner of leather, or a student, or a philosopher, or a secretary, and there's another one for nurses, Catherine of Alexandria, you pray to that patron saint. And then if you're a juror, and you're sitting on a jury, or you're an Italian nurse, because it gets more specific, then you pray, for, pray to Catherine of Siena. And if you're a musician, you pray to the Saint Cecilia. Okay? Why, and I've, I've, on the website, I've got the um, listing on the bottom here where you can go and find that and you can cross-reference you even more. Satan is in, making incredible inroads into counterfeiting himself into Christianity. Not just with what's happening with the patron saints, but how we kind of, the, the prayer for salvation, baptism. If we're not very clear on what those are, People don't really understand what they just did. So many people in these pop-up churches, when they have these mass baptisms, they are so confused. They do not understand what it is that they're actually doing when they get dipped in the water and brought out. They don't know what that's representing, so there, there's confusion. And God is not the spirit of God is, God is not the author of confusion, but love, joy, and peace. Okay, if it's confusing, Satan's not the, uh, God's not the author of it. And then the Etam is a spirit or wizard. Look at Isaiah 19, verses 1 through 3. Isaiah 19, 1 through 3. And it says, The burden of Egypt, behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud, and shall come into Egypt, and the idols of Egypt shall be moved at His presence. The idols, the idols of Egypt, these, these tokens that have no power, but they have power because the people believe there's power in them, and they're buying all into it. So Satan uses that totem, or whatever it is they have, as their focus point. And the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. I will send the Egyptians against the Egyptians, and they shall fight every one against his brother, and every one against his uh, neighbor, city against city, and kingdom against kingdom. And the spirit of God shall fail in the so shall, shall fail in the midst thereof. And I will destroy the counsel thereof, and they shall seek to the idols, 
and to the charmers, and to them that have familiar spirits, and to the wizard. So, that kind of spirit is the same as um, Snape trying to protect Harry Potter from Quirrell. Uh, Quirrell, if you see in the show, had a piece of Voldemort in him. So he was a teacher at the high school, but he was being possessed by Voldemort. Okay? So that's what's going on here. The spirit and the wizard, and that's who the people of Egypt are going to for their counsel. They're going to false places of, of knowledge. And then you have the Shemayim. Uh, that is Israel and an apostasy. This, a Shemayan is an astrologer who divides the heavens into houses for the convenience of their prognostications. Look at Isaiah 47. Isaiah 47, verses 1 through uh, 15. And that's that, that professor, that's a little Voldemort, that's, that's a Professor Trelawney on Harry Potter. She was the professor in the school that taught the kids how to div divine um, knowledge through uh, the stars. Okay, And then come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground, there is no throne, O daughter of Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal, uncover thy locks, make bare the leg, uncover the thigh, pass over the rivers. Thy nakedness, it's talking spiritually here, thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee uh, as a man. As for our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel. So Israel's in apostasy because they were going to other sources than God for what they needed to know. And it says, As for the Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel. Sit thou silent, and get thee into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called the Lady of Kingdoms. I was wroth with my people, I have polluted my inheritance, and given them into thine land. Thou didst show them no mercy upon the ancient, upon the ancient hast thou very heavily laid thy, thy yoke. And, and thou saidst, I shall be a lady forever, so that thou didst not lay these things to thine heart, neither didst remember the latter end of it. Therefore hear now this, thou that art given to pleasures, that dwelleth carelessly, that sayest in thine heart, I am and none else beside me, I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. But these two things shall come to thee in a moment and one day, the loss of children and widowhood, they shall come upon thee in their perfection for the multitude of thy sorceries and for the abundance of thine enchantments. This is why they were being um, thrown into apostasy and uh, the burden of slavery. For thou hast trusted in thy wickedness. Thou hast said, None seeth me, but God sees. Thy wisdom and thy knowledge, not God's wisdom and God's knowledge, it hath uh, perverted thee. And thou hast said in thine heart, I am, and none else beside me. Therefore shall evil, evil come unto thee, thou shalt not know from whence it rises. The mischief shall fall upon thee, thou shalt not be able to put it off. And desolation shall come upon thee suddenly, which thou shalt not know. Stand now with thine enchantments. He, he's kind of provoking them here. Stand with your enchantments, and with the multitude of thy sorceries. Wherein thou hast labored from thy youth. They, they were all into this. If so be, thou shalt be able to profit. See if that's going to help you. Stand by your sorcery. Stand by your enchanter. See if that's going to help you when all this comes. If so be, thou mayest prevail. Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from things that shall come upon thee. Wow, and he goes on to talk about what's going to happen. He says, your stargazers, your prognosticators, your sorcerers, your enchanters are not going to be able to help you when your punishment comes because you turned away from me and started looking to other methods of knowledge rather than what I told you to follow. And then we all know about the uh, horoscope. You got Aquarius, Pisces, Sagittarius, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, and it's got you know your gemstone, your symbol. Um, 
And even the Chinese have a different, they've got the rat, the snake, and you know, they've got different ones, but it's basically based on the same principle. Thinking that you can look up into the stars and actually predict what's going to happen to people's lives. Now, I want you to understand there there is there is something to be said about the zodiac, positively, because there's a name for it in the Bible. Does anybody know what the name for the zodiac is in the Bible? Ezra. It's called a Maseroth. Okay? And the Maseroth is put there. Look at Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, real quick. I know that Satanism and the occult have taken the zodiac and made it a bad thing that we won't touch with a ten-foot pole. But there is something that we need to understand about the Maseroth, and I'm going to teach it in the near future. In um, Romans chapter 1, in verse, let's start in verse uh, 17. And let's start in verse 16 because the context is the gospel. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. The power of God. That's supernatural power. That's the positive supernatural power of God is being used in contrast to the supernatural power of Satan, demons, fallen angels, and principalities and powers of the air. And he says, For it is the gospel... For, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, that is, it is written, the just shall live by faith. And then it goes on to say, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because, they which, that, because that which may be known of God is manifested to them, for God has showed it unto thee, in verse 20, the key, for the invisible things of Him from the creation, invisible things, the supernatural realm, okay? God's getting ready to tell us something. I've preached on this before, but I wanted to kind of sink in. The supernatural realm is revealed by certain things. The invisible things of God, for the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. So if you want to understand the spiritual realm, look what God made. Everything being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. If you want to understand, the Bible says, and it says it more than this, if you want to understand the unseen spiritual conflict, either on the God side or the Satanic side, look at what He made, because He made everything to reveal spiritual truths. One of those things he made that the Bible talks about so clearly is the Maseroth. Each of the constellations, and I'll close here, each of the constellations, 12, have three supporting, I forget what they're called. Each sign has three supporting constellations to define that particular um, sign. And there's 12 of them. If you look out in the stars and you study the stars, there's a reason why it's called uh, uh, the Vir uh, Virgo. There's a reason why it's Gemini, because there's twins out there. There's a reason why... Okay, so you got to... If you can look at it it's circular, there's 12 signs. Each sign has three supporting constellations around it that define that sign. Because remember, God put it there. The greatest... Gospel witness in the universe are the, is the Maseroth. Because it starts with Virgo. And what is Virgo in the constellation? The virgin woman who's bearing precious seed. And one of her constellations has her on a chair holding a little baby. God is preaching the gospel through the stars. And the Greeks and the Babylonians and maybe some other cultures have taken what is the great, one of the greatest sources of the gospel in the universe and perverted it and called every sign something else so that man can't know the gospel. And what's amazing, when I'm going to walk you through this, is when you go from Virgo and you go in order through the constellation, it is more clearly telling the story of redemption. All the way to the end, 
where the last sign before you get back to Virgo is Leo. And that's Jesus. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And it also has, uh, I forget the name of the, 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 I've got to go back and study this, but the heel is being pierced by uh, the serpent. That's in the Bible. In Genesis, that the heel of Christ would be bruised, but that he's stepping on the head of the serpent while he's biting the heel. He's stepping on the head. That comes straight out of the Bible. And the Gemini, the dual nature of Christ, he's God and he's man. And you just follow him all the way over. So what we have to understand is Satan is really busy trying to pervert the truth, trying to hide the truth from mankind, and the Maseroth, as the world calls it, the Zodiac, but it's in the Bible called the Maseroth, M-A-Z-Z-O-R-O-T-H, I believe it is, if you want to look it up. The Maseroth is one of the greatest tools that we have to tell man about their sinful condition and how Jesus came to this earth and died on the cross and rose from the dead. And guess what is in the middle of the Zodiac? The Maseroth slithering his way through. The whole middle of the Zodiac. The crooked serpent. It's a crooked serpent. It's Leviathan. Okay, who is Leviathan? Is it an actual creature in the Bible? No. The Leviathan is Satan. The Leviathan in the Bible is the character of Satan. And the behemoth is how Satan will, is that vehicle that Satan is going to use in the tribulation to get his uh, will done amongst the nations. The, Le the Leviathan and the behemoth are not actual creatures. They are types of Satan. The Leviathan being the character of Satan. And the behemoth in Isaiah, let's talk about in Isaiah... And the behemoth is not a hippopotamus or anything like that. It's not an actual creature. It is the one world religious system that the whore of Babylon is going to be riding during the tribulation. It's amazing how Satan is trying to pervert all of that so that we don't understand the truth and it's visible to the eye if we just understand it. It's one of the greatest witnessing tools we can have. I've not had anybody that I've talked to about the Maseroth not be just like, wow, I didn't know that. You walk them through it. Wow. I mean, you could have a Bible study with someone just talking about the Maseroth and lead them to Christ. Using the, using that. And then when you're done with the little study, start stargaze when it's when because they move. And you've got to wait until it comes around. And then stargaze at that certain sign and say, that's where it is. That's, here's what it means. And then go to the Bible. Because when I take you through this, I can show you Bible verses for every sign that's out there. So this stuff's real, it's alive, it's it's around us. And I hope you're learning something when you come to church that you didn't know before. I hope it's not the same old, same old, just put in different clothes. Because we want this church to be different. And we want you to have tools that you can use to impact other people's lives. So. Yeah.